Hi guys! I'm Janet from World Anvil. So for those of you who don't know, World Anvil is an online world building platform that allows you to write, organize and share your work. But today we're going to talk about immersive world building. That's about how you can get your audience absorbed in your world building, whether it's for your novel or short story or for your RPG campaign. Immersing your audience in your world building and in the mood of your scenes is a great way to keep them engaged with the plot and it's a really important keystone of any successful world building for novels or RPG campaigns. So if you want to find out more about immersive world building, just keep watching. It's time to light up the forge. Why does Hogwarts rustle with moving portraits? whilst Elantris is just really stinky. And why are the minds of Moria darker than Satan's left armpit? It's because there really are only nine or seven or three basic plots, depending on who you ask, which means that immersive world building is vital. It keeps your audience engaged and it adds colour and mood to your locations and the scenes set within them. Get it right and your audience will remember your world long after they leave the table or close your book. So in this primer on immersive world building, we're going to focus on the senses. Now that's for several reasons. Senses give us information about the world. Your characters understand the world by seeing, hearing, smelling and touching. And it's also how your audience can imagine your world building more vividly. Using the senses for immersive world building is also a perfect way to show don't tell. Bob was scared is a lot less effective than Bob felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. With both of them, we know that Bob is scared, but by showing his feelings instead of telling them, our readers actually feel what Bob feels and empathise alongside him. We can also use the senses as symbolic cues to signal the kind of mood that we want to convey in a scene or location. But more about that later. We're going to start with the most commonly written about sense. Can you guess what it is? It's sight. Humans are very visual. We tend to navigate the world by sight pretty much predominantly, provided that we can see. And if it gets dark, well, we just turn on the light. Sight is so valuable because it gives us a clear overview of what's around us without interacting with every single object. As I'm recording this, I can see the sofa and the curtains and the ceiling. I can't hear them, I can't smell them and I can't feel them, but I still know they're there by sight alone. Hello, Sofa. I can see you. So for our characters, sight is usually the first impression they get of a new space or location. And it's a great way to give an overview of the things around them. How we dress our scenes and locations, the items that we put in them, will already have a huge impact on the mood of a scene. If you're in a room with a torture rack in one corner, for instance, it creates a different mood from a tea tray or a suit of armour. Some of the scene dressing will come from the genre of your world. But most items, like a teapot, could be found in any setting. Both Jean-Luc Picard and our torturer need their morning pick-me-up, just like the rest of us. Scene dressing with items, explaining what your protagonist sees, is pretty self-explanatory, but we're going to go one further. Sight reveals a huge number of qualities about the world around us. For example, illumination level, colour, pattern, texture, shape, distance, size, and reflectiveness, that is, if something's shiny or matte. You can use all of these qualities to manipulate the mood in your scene. We're going to try a little writing exercise now, so go grab yourself a piece of paper, or you can write your answers in the comments below. Let's start with a room, a picture gallery. Here's a simple explanation of the objects you see around you. You enter a long gallery. It's dark at one end. There are oil paintings on the wall. There's some furniture at the edge of the room, and there's a carpet on the floor. It's pretty boring, right? But we can completely transform that room by using colour and texture and size and all those other descriptors. If I want to introduce a darker mood, something a bit more sinister, I can play with those descriptors to completely change the mood of the scene. If you're playing along at home, then it's time to write your own version. Start with you enter a gallery and the rest is up to you, all right? La la la, la 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 la, la la la, la 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 la. All right, are you ready? Here's what I came up with. You enter a long gallery. Flaking oil paintings hang in large gilt frames and a few pieces of grimy dark wood furniture squat beneath them. The dust lies thick on the carpet, which disappears into darkness a few steps in front of you. All right, I'm not saying this is the best writing in the world, okay? It's got a lot of adjectives in because I'm trying to prove a point here, but it's certainly got a lot more mood than our first excerpt. 
So let's see how I used the descriptors to create the mood that I managed to create. The darkness was taken from the original prompt, but by moving it to the end, I make it more prominent. The dark wood, the gilt frames, are all dark colours. They set this colour scheme of the room and they make it a dark and ominous place. With texture, we used flaking oil paintings to give a sense of decay, like the space has been forgotten, and that makes it seem more gloomy, more lonely. And then for distance, the darkness is a few steps in front of you. Now that's quite imminent, that's quite close. We want the darkness to seem almost oppressive. For size, we used a large gilt frame. Again, we're going for an oppressive and grand feeling. And for reflectiveness, the grimy furniture would be matte. Now that's how we can tell it's grimy from a distance. This is a scene that doesn't reflect light, it sucks it in. What I did with the darkness there, mentioning the edge of the vision, is a great way to create suspense. We can see that Tolkien uses it as well in The Minds of Moria. He describes Enter steep rocks and stairs and passages. And every stairwell or passage that they don't follow is another area they can't see. It could house danger and it's ominous. It's scary. But let's go back to our gallery again because I want to make it into a totally different kind of space. We're doing a verbal overhaul, alright guys? We're going to use those same items, the pictures, the carpet, the furniture and the darkness but I want to create a space that's a lot lighter and brighter. So guys, again, if you're playing along at home, this is the time to pause that video and write out your excerpt. Start with, you walk into a gallery, and the rest is up to you. La la la, la 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 la, la la la, la 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 la. All right, are you ready? This is what I came up with. You enter a gallery. Oil paintings shine in golden frames and elegantly curved chestnut chairs reflect the fruiting vines in the wallpaper behind. A champagne carpet stretches beyond the pool of sunlight at your feet. Phew! All right, so that's a pretty different room already. Let's take a closer look at how I use those sight descriptors to really change the mood of the room. We still have darkness at one end, but we focused on the illumination itself, the sunlight. The colours are chestnut, gold, and green from the vines. And then there's the champagne colour of the carpet. These are all much lighter and brighter, and their symbolism is luxurious and life-enhancing. Notice it was champagne rather than yellow or beige. We now have a cheery, life-affirming pattern, and that's the fruiting vines on the wallpaper. Patterns give a sense of movement and life to a room in general. The elegant curve of the chairs seems refined, and although we haven't defined distance specifically, we've said that the carpet stretches beyond the pool of sunlight. So we've implicitly placed the darkness further away from our protagonist. By changing the frames from gilt, which are usually very heavy, to golden, we've altered the implied size. We've also achieved a change in size by changing the furniture, which in my mind's eye was this very big, heavy trunk, into curved chairs, now they seem much more delicate, they're also going to let light pass through them. Now that's going to be important for the next one, which is reflectiveness. This is a big one in this scene. We have shiny paintings, reflective furniture, light coloured furnishings, and sunlight bouncing off everything. The gallery seems like a much lighter, brighter space, and that gives a totally different mood to the scene in general. Was it different from what you wrote? Please do put your writing in the comments below. I think everyone's going to get a lot from seeing how different writers approach this task. One small caveat on colours though. Watch out for colour symbolism in different cultures. White in some cultures means innocence and in other cultures it implies death. Red might be lucky or it might be dangerous. And the culture that you're creating might have their own colour symbolism. Just something to keep in mind as you're world building. And of course, we've just been doing a small area, a room, but you can use this technique for a whole geographical area if you want to as well. Say you have a grass plain. Is the grass green? That gives a totally different mood to brown or yellow grass. If your mountains are redstone, they'll set a different mood to yellow sandstone or black basalt or even obsidian. So you can see that once you finish world building a location, whether that's a forest, a city or a mine, you can enhance the mood by defining the colours textures, illumination, and these other sight facets. The moment you put your characters in those locations, they, and the audience, are instantly going to pick up on the mood that you're trying to convey, and are instantly going to have a much more immersive experience. And that's really one of the keys to immersive world building. Creating a sense-rich world, and then curating your description of it, to bring your world building to life in the most engaging and emotional way. If this video has helped you at all with immersive world building, if it's helped you create mood in your scenes, or if it's inspired you at all, please give us a thumbs up. If you're ready for some serious world building, then head over to worldanvil.com to get started.
And if you guys want to know more about the Building Worlds with Tail Foundry competition, that's having the pro writers behind Tail Foundry write a short story in your world, then head over to the Building Worlds with Tail Foundry competition page and we'll link that in the doobly-doo as well. All right, guys, there's only one thing left to say. So that's grab your hammer and go world build. Just think of something, just something to keep in mind while you're world building. This, ah, itchy nose. Oh, Jesus. I hate makeup. It's the worst thing in the entire world. Okay, that's an that exaggeration, but still. Um, oh, this is hard this morning.